You've been hearing us talk about Imperial Yeast for a while now, and that's because we absolutely love this stuff. With 200 billion cells in each pitch right pouch, we rarely even need to make starters these days. Unfortunately, not everybody has the access to Imperial Yeast, those of us out here on the West Coast do, because they're based out of Portland, Oregon. But things are about to change. Imperial Yeast is excited to announce the opening of their East Coast location, which is huge for those who want the freshest yeast possible with the best pitch rates, but brew on the other side of the country. They're going to start by offering their four most popular strains, A38 Juice, A07 Flagship, L13 Global, and GO3 Deer, with the goal of providing their full lineup of yeast by mid-2021. So start your planning now at imperialyeast.com. Soon after starting Brewlosophy back in 2014, around the time I was bringing contributors on board, talk of us starting a podcast began to pick up. Our readers regularly let us know that they wanted to hear us talk about the stuff we were publishing on the website. Well, as a married father of three with a normal full-time job, I was hesitant to move forward with the idea for a while, in part because I'm a bit neurotic and uh, knew that making it sound good would require a decent investment of time and money, but also because I was afraid of overwhelming my family and myself. Well, four years Years ago this month, thanks to the dedication of every Brewlosophy crew member, as well as the support of our sponsors, fans, and our families, uh, we dropped our first episode, and here we are today at episode 180. This has been such a fun and fulfilling ride. I'm so incredibly proud of what we've created. You are listening to the Brewlosophy podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and joining me on this Brew and A episode to answer questions submitted by listeners is contributor Cade Job. Hey, dude, I didn't realize it had been four years. Holy crap, that's uh, that's amazing. Yeah, four years ago this month in fact pretty nuts that's nuts i mean i remember listening to the first episode i mean i remember you doing like the teasers before the first episode came back i wasn't affiliated with philosophy at that point but i remember like being excited about the podcast dude it doesn't feel like it was four years ago holy crap <laughs> i know it's nuts man absolutely nuts well and we've had a really productive 2021 so far in addition to keeping up with publishing two articles uh at brewlosophy.com and pushing out an episode of this show every week uh you recently started a new podcast the brew lab and the response after just four episodes has been incredibly positive how's that been going for you man Oh, it's been fantastic. I, I, uh, I've been so excited to do the podcast and so excited to see people actually enjoying it. I mean, I was terrified. You know this because I talked to you a lot about it, but I was terrified that people just weren't going to listen to the show. I know. God, that's when one of the things. It. Whenever you take a risk, right? You never know what you're going to get. Yeah, that's exactly right. But no, it's been great. And uh, we got a lot of good stuff coming up, too. So I think we're four episodes or five episodes in at the time of recording this and, and we got a lot left to go. So uh, I'm excited. Yeah, I love the show. Uh, you know, I, I'm kind of behind the scenes on the Brew Lab, but I absolutely love listening to every episode so far. It's so geeky, and I love that. Uh, you're doing an excellent <laughs> job, and I'm looking forward to answering some questions with you today. All right, if you like what we're up to and you want uh, to help keep us doing it, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy. By committing to a small monthly pledge over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. World. Our next session is coming up in just a few short days, uh, Saturday, March 27th, 2021. And the guest is Vito DeLucci, who, in addition to working behind the scenes at More Beer, recently started his own brewery in Brentwood, California called Imperial Beer Project. Prior to going pro, Vito was a uh, home brewer who did really well for himself on the competition circuit. He's also just a really cool dude to chat with. So in order to be a part of this event, you have to make your pledge of just $3 or more per month at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by this Friday, March 26th, 2021 at the latest. Otherwise, we won't have time to get you added to the private Facebook group where all of these sessions are hosted. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind leaving a rating and review of this show in Apple Podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts uh, that allows for reviews, at least, we would really appreciate it. It helps those people who may not have heard of the show to find it more easily. Plus, we just like reading what you guys think about the show. Feedback is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high-quality stainless fittings at great prices with super-fast shipping. Learn more at BrewersHardware.com, and don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's BrewersHardware.com. 
Listener Kevin McDonald had some feedback on some of the music we use in this show. He said, I've listened to every episode of the Brewlosophy podcast so far and always look forward to my drive to work Tuesday mornings because I know a new episode will be waiting for me. Well, thank you, Kevin. We appreciate that. My commute is about an hour, so I'm typically parking as the closing song starts to play, which means I spend the next eight hours whistling or when I'm alone, singing those first few lines over and over. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey because it soothes my throat. What sucks is that's all I I know of that song and I want to hear the whole thing. It's got such a great vibe. What group is that? What's the song called and where can I find it? Uh, okay, it's been a long time since I mentioned it on the show, which probably explains why I've been getting more emails about this uh, recently. Most of the music that we use on this show was created by a friend of mine from elementary school. His name is Mark Gadgetar, uh, and he's been in some pretty well-known bands like the Blood Brothers, who he played the drums for, as well as some really great hip-hop groups, uh, which is most of the music that, that we're using in this show. The particular song, Kevin, you're referring to and so many others have asked about is called Body High by Mark's group African Tiger. I I don't believe they ever released that song for, you know, to, to Amazon and Spotify and stuff. I'm not sure, but Mark was cool enough to send me the MP3 file so that I could share it with all of you. If you head over to brewlosophy.com slash music, you can download the song Body High, the entire track. Plus, there are links to some of Mark's other projects. Check it out. He's a super talented dude. Caden, who doesn't love that song, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is some urban the bull. Um, yeah, it's homegrown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard it enough times that I know the words too. Uh, I yeah, I love that song. I actually, um, it, the it's the the bumper between uh, the segments that we do. There, that's it's uh, th- that's one that I asked you for like a year and a half ago, and it's actually my uh, text message ringtone now. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. Yeah, he's a Mark's a really talented guy, and uh, I mean he's he, he plays the guitar, he plays the drums, he he does his own producing. Um, you know, I don't even know what it's called, but but um, uh, synthesizers and stuff like that. Just a really talented guy. So check out all the stuff he has to offer. All right, if you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy or leave us a note on social media. There's nothing new about adding weird things to beer, but what I find fascinating is just what some brewers decide to add to their beer. A listener from Melbourne, Australia named Hayden Henderson sent me a mixed fermentation beer he made with Saccharomyces, Britannomyces, Lactobacillus, and Pediococcus that also contains a couple herbs native to Australia. Lemon myrtle, which is a flowering plant that smells strongly of, you guessed it, lemon, and salt bush, which I believe is named salt bush because it grows in saltier soils, uh, but it's a ground cover plant that, that has these little berries that I guess are edible, uh, and, and I imagine it's what Hayden used in this beer. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. Very clear, kind of light looking. I got nothing on smell. The smell doesn't factor in a lot for us, dude. A little sour. Yeah, it's a sour. Yeah. yeah it's all right. It's I, all right. It's, it's pretty, all right. Light. Yeah, pretty light. A light sour. Ooh, there's a What's type of beer Gosh? for a light sour. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, dude, there's some like European name. It's, oh, gosh. <laughs> I am the key master of ghouls. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad. I like it. I like it. Yeah, it's all right. It's it's, it's sa- sour, fruity, sour. It's a fruity sour. Do you taste fruit, right? Hmm? Yeah, it's a fruity sour. But without the tartness. It's a fruity sour. Fruity sour. Fruity sour. I'm just a five on it myself. You're a sour man too, dude. Yeah, but it's it's a weak sour. Weak is in its presentation or <laughs> weak in flavor? <laughs> in like, flavor. Like, it doesn't have the 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 tartness of the sour. Uh, yeah. Hey, it's, it's all right. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good a guess. I guess. I give it a pretty good a guess goes falls in the three, four range. I give it a four. I already said five, so total five it negative tibis. six. Or four no? Jersey Eagles at 352. This beer was very interesting. I agree with the guys in that it was it wasn't really tart that at all, really. Uh, but, but it did have a nice kind of balanced, funky, wild character to it. Uh, it. Personally, I felt the lemon character was just a bit strong to the point that it almost tasted artificial. Um, but but I, 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 it's probably because lemon myrtle, I mean, obviously it's not a lemon plant, so it almost had like a lemon pledge character to it. Not in a, not in a terribly uh, unpleasant way, just, just really, you know, that's so strong that it feels artificial. Yeah, interesting. Like those flavors sound really, uh, really interesting together. It sounds kind of like a funky goza or something, you know, like a like a slightly sour, salty, 
um, lemony, lemony beer. That's really interesting. I'm surprised that the guys didn't pick up uh, more on the aroma. Uh, they said that they weren't really able to tell anything on the aroma. Who knows whenever they were actually, you know, I don't know how late this was in the, in the <laughs> tasting session, but, um, uh, but yeah, that's a, uh, the beer sounds really good, right? Like that certainly sounds like something I would like to drink. Surprising also that it didn't get very sour, uh, with all those, uh, you know, with Brettanomyces and Lactobacillus and Pediococcus that was in there. Uh, it really interesting. And I learned t- about two new spices today that um, <laughs> I'd like to use in cooking at some point. Yeah, I don't know if we have much access to these. I was doing some Googling on, on lemon myrtle and saltbush and uh, at least Australian saltbush. There's there are, you know, s- different types of saltbush, some that grow here in North America. But the specific one that Hayden said he used was was native to Australia. And yeah, I'm just not sure what our access is to it now. Uh, I, I have a friend in town. Um, he's a he's a kind of a, a pro brewer um, with, that has been impacted by COVID. So it's tough to find his stuff out there right now. But he brought over a pale ale to my house a couple of years ago with uh, I, be, I believe it's called Verbena or Verbana something and uh, muddled it in the glass and then poured his pale ale that he, he brewed. He, he designed this pale ale recipe to go well with the lemon character from the Verbena that he brought over. I'm telling you, it was surprisingly delicious, really fresh lemon character, even though there was no lemon in it. So I get where I get where Hayden was coming from with uh, using this lemon myrtle to amplify that citrus thick character. I can't say I picked up the salt bush, but I also have no idea what that tastes like. Um, in my in my experience of the beer, there was something unique, kind of an earthy thing on the finish. But I just I kind of chalked that up to it being a wild ale. Um, but either way, good job, Hayden. And I really appreciate you sending beer to me all the way from Melbourne, Australia. That was rad. So uh, if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage reviewed by Jersey and Tim on the show, you can email me, Marshall at brewlosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. When we return from this break, answers to your questions. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to grainfather.com, that's grainfather.com, and get started today. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code code BrewPod. That's B-R-U-P-O-D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. We get Brew and A questions on an almost daily basis, far too many for us to address in a single episode. So if you've submitted one and we don't get to it today, I promise you it will be on a future show. All right. First question comes from Jeremy Ford. 
I built a five tap keyser last winter with a draft tower made of black iron pipe. Uh, to cool the tower, I have a half inch silicone tube running through it, recirculating chilled water from a five gallon keg. I also cut up bits of pipe insulation material and shoved in as much as, as possible. During the cooler months, it works great. I put my temp probe towards the top of the water recirc keg close, uh, close to the inlet and, uh, with the outlet being at the bottom and set it to 44F, which is 7C. Uh, perfect pours. Summer months is when I run into the issues. The compressor constantly runs to chill the cooling keg to 44 uh, Fahrenheit or 7C. I learned the hard way and froze everything. <laughs> oh boy. The coolest I could get the recirc water was 50F or 10C and I poured nothing but foam. I moved the temp probe to measure ambient air and set it to 30F or negative 1C and set the temp difference to 10F. Then I lowered the temp difference one degree at a time till my serving temp on my carbonated water was 34 degrees Fahrenheit or 1C. And my beer was still pouring foamy. My question is, how the heck do I avoid uh, foamy pours during warmer months with my setup? Oh, man. First of all, that's an awesome idea to put like a cast iron, you know, black pipe uh, out of the top of your keyser. I think that probably looks pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, the, uh, really interesting, too. And having lived in Texas and had my keyser in the garage, I definitely know what you're talking about, getting those foamy pores yeah. um, in the warmer months. Um, you know, I, I have a couple of answers. I First of all, I have a shitty cop out answer, um, <laughs> which is uh, just get your tap cold by running cold beer through it. Right. So you, you can just run beer through your tap like and it doesn't have to be a lot. You don't have to run like a whole pint off, but run like half a pint and then just, you know, either set it aside and come back to it later or, or do that. That's one of the ways that I just sort of worked around it, because um, even even when you chill the lines themselves, the tap itself, right, like the, the actual faucet. Um, is going to be warm, right? Because it's sitting at whatever room temperature or if it's outside like it was in my garage, it's probably sitting at 90, 95 degrees or even 100 degrees right. um, over some parts of the of the, of the of the summer. So when that cold 38 degree beer hits that 90 degree tap, it causes a huge amount of foam, yeah. right? And, and so that's kind of a crappy cop-out answer to just run beer through it to get it cold. Uh, but it is something that you can do if, if you're willing to, you know, either dump the beer or just let that beer sit until the foam sort of resides. Yeah. But a, a, a more realistic answer, um, I think you're on the right track by recirculating cold water in there. Although I would wonder how much those hoses are themselves insulating the cold water yeah. um, in, in the summer. I don't know if there's a way to like change your draft lines that may maybe to something or tr change the, not the draft line, the recirculating water line to something that um, maybe is less insulating than, than like vinyl hoses or something. Um, or, you know, and the, the other question I had too is, is I don't know where you're recirculating the water at. Is it in the, you know, is it in the, the keyser that has your beer? Um, it sounds like your, your water's in a different spot. Um, so I was thinking maybe get a mini fridge or something like that. But I don't know. That's sort of, it's a really interesting problem. Well, so the problem is that, that uh, t I, don't, I don't understand why uh, some brewers uh, choose to go the, the tower route over plugging your faucets direct, you know, tapping them through a, a piece of wood that you, you know, you extend the collar, you make a collar for your, your, chest freezer and because that way the lines at least at the very least your all of your beer lines are in the coldest part of your free you know they're in your freezer your chest freezer um the when i think of of towers my when i first started thinking about getting into the whole kegerator keyser thing i bought a two tap tower keyser because i thought towers looked cool and i what i what i've kind of come to is that they're way more form over function uh because they do pose and i live in a place that gets very warm in the summer i mean we get 110 115 degrees fahrenheit here uh which is over 35 c we'll put it that way uh <laughs> uh here in fresno and and it's the same thing i mean when i go out to pour off of my normal uh non-tower kegerator or keyser in the summer months. I have to do like you said, Kate, I have to run cold beer through before I get a good pour. Here's the thing though, and I, I don't think that was a cop-out response actually. I think it was probably the one that I, that I agree with most because uh, you have to waste a little bit of beer if you want to get a good pour. I, I've talked to so many home brewers who are just so adamant about tossing a little bit of beer. You're drinking crappy beer. If you're going to drink the stuff that was in your lines, 
I mean, by all means, go for it. But not only that, during the warmer months, like like Jeremy is saying here, you're going to get a bunch of foam as well. So not only are you getting, you know, the line beer, but you're getting a foamy pour. It's just not good. I I don't care if I've let my uh, if I've let a beer sit or my my tap sit for more than 20 minutes, I'm still pouring off a good four or five ounces before I serve somebody a beer. Um, that's just the way I do it. Now, there are some other solutions. If you're not using a uh, three sixteenths inch or four millimeter, five millimeter ish, uh, beer line. That's one thing you should probably do. The better, the more constriction you have, uh, the less foamy pores you're going to have. But then you can also extend those uh, those line, your liquid lines as well. I, I got an email just the other day, someone saying, you know, I, I I use six foot beer line and it works fine for me. Well, that's cool, but I like to I like to go about double that. I like it much longer. I'd rather have a slow, non foamy, full pint pour uh, than I would, you know, uh, saving a dollar on on beer line. It just doesn't bother me. But in doing that. You're gonna run your beer through your lines until it, in, you know, until you clear the lines before drinking it. At least that's what I do because that's that. I don't again. I don't like that line beer, um, but I can't think of anything else. Jeremy, you, you're you're working real hard to to cool your tower. I you know if at least where I live, you, you know, the, work as hard as you want. When it's 110 degrees outside, you're not gonna get that tower cool enough, and you're just gonna have a couple foamy pours uh, right off the bat. So. Yeah, exactly. I like that you did bring up that about the restriction in your draft lines, because I think that's something that people don't play with enough. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think every keg system is different um, and it depends on where your kegs are, where you're actually, you know, uh, where your your tap lines are coming out, yeah. you know what temperature those faucets are. It's really fun, um, and there's some really good information out there. Um, there's a draft quality manual that the Brewers Association puts out uh, that that uh, is meant for commercial, um, you know, applications. But it, you can certainly apply the 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 theory the theory um, to your at home kegerator. So that's cool. But yeah, I hope that was a, a good enough answer for you. Um, next question is from Daniel Lombardi. Um, and Daniel says, I recently purchased the same Culligan RV filter that you use in your setup. I think he's talking about you, Marshall, because yeah, I don't <laughs> use an RV filter. <laughs> um, but up until now, I use my tap water from our kitchen sink and then add a Campton tablet. I've always assumed that the Camden tablet is used to get rid of chloramine and or chlorine in the water, depending on what my city uses to kill bacteria. My question is, do you use both the RV, RV filter and Camden tablet on brew day? Or do you mainly use the RV filter to get rid of unwanted tastes from your outdoor hose or faucet? I've read conflicting studies stating RV carbon filters do not get rid of chloramine and or chlorine. So, uh, Paul Amico, uh, the guy who does all the hop chronicles lately is a water guy. He's actually a, a he's an engineer who works in the water industry and uh, he'll tell you the same thing that John Palmer will tell you the same thing that Colin Kaminsky will tell you. you, you a RV filter, a carbon filter is not going to rid your water of chloramine or chlorine. And if you have highly chlorinated water or chloraminated water, uh, you will still smell the chlorine once you run it through your filter. Now, I am very, very fortunate where I live that I don't have highly chlorinated water and they don't use chloramines here where, where I'm at, which is stable. So chloramines will remain in the water even if you let it sit out. Chlorine will volatilize off if you let your water sit for a while or as you're heating it up. At least that's what I've been told. And we have such low levels of it that it's never been a real issue for me. So I do not use... Uh, potassium or sodium metabisulfite, also known as Campton tablets, uh, to treat my water prior to brewing. I've never, I've never lived in an area where the chlorine is so bad where I feel like I have to do that. Now, if if you are still smelling chlorine on your water after running it through the uh, the RV filter, absolutely, there's absolutely nothing wrong with adding a little bit of uh, metabisulfite and and make just to make sure that your water is good. Having never done that, I feel uh, a bit ignorant and I don't, I don't think I can really truly speak to doing this, but I do believe that when you do that, you're supposed to rack off of any sediment that falls out uh, to the bottom of the kettle. And so uh, the friends that I know who have, who have used chlorine, there are areas in Fresno that get way different water than I get. Uh, and the friends that I know who are doing that or using Campton tablets in their water are doing it in a bucket or in a uh, like extra fermentation vessel. And then they'll they'll pour off, you know, they're, they're decanting the treated water off of whatever sediment falls out. Um, I, I don't know if it matters, but but that's what I would do. Again, if you're not smelling chloramine or chlorine in your water and, and the water tastes good and you're cool with it, I don't know if it's necessary that you use Campton, but you are not going to get rid of uh, those two things uh, by running it through an RV filter. 
Yeah, I, w- I was a little worried when you brought up Paul because I, I forgot that Paul is a water engineer. Um, <laughs> and so I had I had done some research on this and I was like, crap, what if I'm wrong or if I disagree with Paul? But I don't. Um, and that's great. <laughs> um, so so the things that I found uh, about this were pretty interesting. I actually found a white paper um, from 2009 by a guy named Robert Potwara. Um, and he talked about the difference between what they call granular activated carbon filters and surface enhanced activated carbon filters. Hmm. And uh, from everything that I can see, the basic RV filter is granular activated carbon. And that, like you said, does not filter out uh, chloramines, especially. Um, they do serve, they do have this advanced filter. Culligan makes an advanced RV filter called the D30, which I've read uh, may actually remove chloramine. But I'm kind of with you, Marshall, in that I, one, I don't ever use an activated carbon filter because my water tastes fine and I've never really had an issue. I'm more concerned with that um, medicinal reaction that's going to happen if chlorine or chloramine comes in contact with malt right. uh, during the mash. I've tasted a bunch of Band Aid beers at homebrewing competitions. And I brewed a Band-Aid beer uh, myself uh, whenever I was living in Austin. And so that's why I use Camden. It's just a, it's just so easy insurance. I mean, for a five gallon batch, you don't even need a whole tab. I think you just need like a half a tablet. I think right. one tablet will get chlorine and chloramine out of 10 or 11 gallons of water. So it's just such a small um, ingredient uh, just to have that little, you know, added, added benefit. Um, and again, like I said, I'm doing that with just straight tap water, like not even carbon filtering it just doing adding a Camden tablet to straight tap water and I'm making um in my opinion <laughs> really good beers so so how how exactly are you using it because I've got a whole <laughs> back a few years ago there was a big thing about sodium metabisulfite so I picked up uh, a whole pound of the stuff and then I never ended up using it and I've been thinking I believe you can use either sodium or potassium metabisulfite because it's the sulfite that reacts with the chlorine and chloramine to pull it out right yeah, Hundo P. I just did a presentation actually um, uh, for one of my classes here at Oregon State about brewing with sulfites. And that's what I found out. Yeah. So, I mean, sodium or uh, potassium metabisulfite, whichever one. Um, and, and oftentimes, too, I didn't know this until I was looking up, uh, looking this up. Camden tablet is usually potassium right. metabisulfite, uh, but it doesn't necessarily always, right? It's the metabisulfite that does it. And the way I use it is I just grind up um, the the Camden tablet. Um, I have a whole, I have a huge bag of Camden tablets that I'll probably have for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> but, but I have that, I just grind up that tablet and then sprinkle it in whenever I add my salts uh, to the water. So when I'm adding gypsum and everything, and I don't rack off of it, I just use that as my brewing water, uh, dump my mash into it and get everything going. Awesome. And then how long, how long do you, you don't wait any time or? Nope. (laughs) Um, It's my understanding is it's pretty instantaneous, or at least that's what I read. I haven't done any independent research on that. Um, So this is just personal experience, but I just add, I, like I said, grind it up with my salts, dump them in, stir it up a little bit and then add my grains in. Okay, cool. Yeah. I think I'm going to start doing that Uh, though. I, I often collect my water the night before I brew. So I imagine if I do that in I have a uh, one of the eight, those I think it's eight gallon um, Spidel fermentation tanks. Mm-hmm. And so and it has the port on the bottom, right? The valve on the bottom. So I figure if I collect my water, add a little bit of sodium metabisulfite, let it do its thing in there. And then I mean, just like you said, added insurance that takes an extra 20 seconds, right? Yeah, yeah. And and so it, now I'm the one asking all the questions. It's, it's surprising <laughs> after over a decade of brewing, I've never done, I've never treated my water like this. So it, if it, if I add, let's say I'm just kind of being uh, whimsical and, and not really too careful, and I just sprinkle a little bit of SMB in the water, it could it negatively impact the flavor, or is that stuff going to precipitate out regardless? Um, a couple of things happen to the sulfite, right? Like you, you're a long way from when the beer, when the sulfite gets in, like the finished product, right? So yes, some things will pre- precipitate out. Um, other things will volatize off when you boil it, and then the sulfites al- also will react with. Um, carbonyls and phenols once the beer is finished, right? So if there's any sulfite that carries its way through, I I can't say that there's going to be much that does this, but if there's any sulfite that carries all the way through to the end of the fermentation, it's going to have those antioxidant characteristics that we like about adding potassium metabisulfite or uh, sodium metabisulfite at the end, right? right, uh, During packaging. We've done a bunch of experiments on that that show that that may be uh, a beneficial way to increase shelf stability. Right. Um, So, so yeah, I mean, the, the things that are in there, 
are probably only going to be a benefit. At least that's my understanding of the science and, and my research that, that I did into it. I'm always subject to being corrected or, or to reading additional research. But yeah, I think that that's totally a way that, that you can just add this as additional insurance and not be concerned about any negative effects that are going to happen later. Well, I figured out the new way I'm treating my water now. Thanks for the question, <laughs> yeah, Daniel. Next, <laughs> next short and shoddy batch is just going to have a sprinkle. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not going to measure that out, right? Right, exactly. Next question comes from John Toomey. He says, I'm aware of your guys' thoughts on efficiency with the short and shoddy methods, but was wondering if any of you have ever used a continuous recirculation during the mash, and if so, did that increase efficiency? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and jump on this one real quick because I don't know if you've ever brewed a, a real short and shoddy batch, Cade. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> You're not brave enough, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm really not. Um, I actually have. Uh, I, I know that you, you, Cade, have brewed uh, normal batches of beer using a, a kind of traditional fly sparge or continuous sparge setup. So you can speak to the efficiency of that. Um, a, about a year ago, I picked up a couple, I think they call them solar pumps. Uh, they're really cheap on Amazon, like 20 bucks a pop wired them all up and I did brew a couple batches, short and shoddy batches. Uh, so like 25, 30 minute mash rests where I recirculated the entire time. I, I did see a, a slight bump in my efficiency, or at least I think I did. I mean, when you're brewing that way, <laughs> efficiency tends to have kind of a, uh, you know, like a two to three point delta or this range within which it tends to fall. And for me, that's about 65 to 70% when I do a, a 30 minute mash rest. So I cut half of the a traditional mash off. Um, it, it wasn't enough for me to keep doing it because I, I don't like cleaning pumps. And so I stopped using the pump altogether. Um, I, what I found is that if I stir that mash, just gently stir it once every 10 minutes or so for the 30 minute mash rest, I'm getting right about 67, 68% of total brew house efficiency anyways. And that is perfectly fine with me for a full volume, no sparge batch. That's only about a point or two less than what I was getting with a 60 minute mash rest. Yeah, that's. I'm glad that you brought that up. Those those two things. There are two things that I think impact efficiency for a home brewer, right? And one of those is stirring the wort, uh, so breaking up those dough balls and getting water access to the actual sugar, so that or to the starches, so that they can turn it into sugars. And the second thing is grain crush. Um, and to me, those are the two biggest things that are going to improve your efficiency. There, yeah. are, there are other things you can do, like you said, like doing a continuous recirculation. Um, I actually use continuous recirculation now uh, with my unibrow uh, setup. So oh, right. I have the temperature probe in uh, in line on our recirculating uh, pump uh, because I've got two uh, elements that heat the kettle. Uh, so yeah, so I use that, that uh, uh, continuous recirculation during my mashes now. I haven't noticed a huge bump. Uh, from from efficiency. But what I do notice is whenever I, um, especially since I've now got like a brew in a bag, brew in a basket system, uh, when I really finally crush my grain, it really, really increases my efficiency. I'm yeah. talking like like 10 points. Wow. Like I could wow. be at, you know, uh, 60 or, or 65 and go up to 75 or even 80 um, just by doing grain crush. Um, and then the other thing that that I found really interesting. And I think I got this from you, Marshall. I uh, was stirring the mash, right? Stirring it at like 15 minutes and 30 minutes. If you're doing a 60, uh, 60 minute, I usually just stir it twice, once at 15 and once at 30. And that also really, really uh, increased my efficiency. Yeah. I noticed that when I was fly sparging because um, I thought, oh, you know, fly sparging, I'm going to, I'm going to increase my efficiency because I'm spraying off a uh, rinsing all of these additional sugars that may be like stuck to grain husks or right. whatever. Um, yeah. And that's true. True, you do get a higher efficiency uh, from fly sparging, but again, only up to um, only up to a point, and that's where again grain crush and stirring the mash really, really those those are where I saw the biggest impact to efficiency. Yeah, so basically, John, you can you can continuously recirculate uh, if you want to. I really what that's going to do is kind of stabilize the temperature of your mash, and that's where it helps the most in my experience. Uh, but if if you're doing it just for efficiency reasons, you're going to get similar results by stirring. So yeah, exactly. All right, uh, next question is from Jithin Shaji. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm a home brewer who does small three gallon batches. I've been looking for the best way to oxygenate my beer and came across the topic of adding hydrogen peroxide. On paper, this should work fine, but I was not able to get any concrete proof of this 
or of if this would work or not. I was hoping if you had some information on this or if you had the bandwidth to do an experiment on it. <laughs> so I'm going to give the, the practical response. Uh, I did some poking around, but I trust, Cade, that you've probably got a better uh, scientific uh, re- response to Jith in here. Um, I would never do that. And it, o- only because I don't like adding weird stuff to beer in general, whether that's, uh, you know, f- weird fruits, uh, whether that's salt bush. I just don't do that. And ha- the thought of putting hydrogen peroxide in-, in water is not something that I'm interested in. But also, um, oxygenation is not a, a, an aspect of brewing in my process that I've ever concerned myself with. We've talked about this on previous episodes. I've never owned an oxygen tank. I barely even worry about aerating my wort. Uh, you know, when it when it I just transfer it roughly to the to the fermentation vessel from the kettle. I suppose it's not that I don't care nearly enough about oxygenation to go to the extent of adding something like hydrogen peroxide. Yes, on paper I did a little poking around. It does look like it should work. It's not something I've ever tried. It's not something I would ever be interested in trying. Yeah, this is this is really interesting. I'd love to see, you know, you, you say on paper this should work fine. I'd love to see what you were looking at um, or what your thought process was behind that. Um, I did find a, a, a really interesting study out of China um, where they used hydrogen peroxide and ozone during malt steeping uh, to increase enzyme uh, production. And they found that it had like generally beneficial outcomes. It's a really recent study. I think it was 20... Ooh, 2020 or 2021. Hmm. Um, and they actually found that it made higher fermentable sugars, increased free amino nitrogen, lower turbidity and lower beta glucans, which are all things that are really, really important. You know, beta glucans are what cause stuck mashes. Yeah. Um, you know, and then obviously having higher fermentable sugars means that you can get more out of the beer or out of the, the grain. Um, so that was really interesting, but I wasn't really able to see um, a clear link between hydrogen peroxide and yeast um, aeration, right? So usually when we're talking about oxygenating beer, it's providing the conditions for yeast to bloom, right? To do what they need to do um, so that they can increase their cell walls, regulate and make sure that that um, sugars and nutrients can come from outside the cell into the cell and that things stay inside the cell that need to be inside the cell. Um, Um, And so that's really interesting. There is evidence to suggest that, you know, reactive oxygen species, which are hydrogen peroxides, may actually do those things. Um, But there's also a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, that uh, those species can also be really toxic to yeast and can kill uh, can kill yeast. So I would be really interesting to see what your thought process was and kind of where you were pulling this from and then and then check it out. I, like Marshall, would be really worried about um, using hydrogen peroxide in my beer. And that's just because, I, you know, I use high pro- hydrogen peroxide as a disinfectant for like scrapes and bruises. Right. And so that just seems kind of... Um, uh, like maybe maybe a little bit too much, especially given the other ways that you can add oxygen, right? Like shaking the carboy or the fermenter, if you're a home brewer, may be enough to um, to oxygenate the beer sufficiently. You can also try olive oil or you know palm oil or, or avocado oil um, if you're really looking for a, a, an easy way. Like a couple of drops, maybe all it all you need yeah. uh, to to do that. So I think there are a bunch of other solutions. That doesn't mean that hydrogen peroxide is a bad solution. It, you just could be it just means that i'm not really clear about the science i don't know that i would feel comfortable yet um adding it to beer but cool i mean send me some um send me some information on this and maybe we can do an episode on the brew lab because of it yeah if there's if there's science out there i mean i'd be willing to consider it i just at this point it's not again first off my lack of interest in oxygenation overall but then also adding stuff that I use to, to you know, put my, on my kids' cuts and whatnot. Not yeah. Thing, yeah. So. Uh, all right. Next question comes from Matt Adams. He says, I was recently putting Ray's Make America Amber Again recipe into Beersmith. Fantastic recipe, by the way. Uh, and the mm-hmm. SRM was four points higher than Ray's recipe said. Not wanting to make significantly darker beer, I was thinking of changing the recipe, but I was worried it might affect the finished beer. My question, when making a batch of beer from an existing recipe, should I modify it with brewing software to hit the projected OG SRM and IBU or is it best to just use the grain bill as stated in the recipe oh I love I always love this question and (laughs) it's because I always give the same response um and it's try it and see what happens yeah all right um you know uh, like the first thing you've got to know before you're adjusting brewing software um or you know adjusting grains or anything in the recipes what does the recipe taste like right Uh, I mean and I guess I would say 
let me back up real quick. I guess I would say there's two things, you know, there were two ways that I approached this question. And one was when I first started brewing and what I do now. Okay. So when I first started brewing, I always just used the recipe. I mean, exactly as the recipe was wherever I found it. If that was in a book like, um, you know, Jamil and John Palmer's uh, book, Brewing Classic Styles, pull a recipe out of that and then brew exactly what that recipe says in the amounts that it says to do it. Right. Right. And that always resulted in good beers for me. I never I never had a problem um, doing that unless I screwed something up. Right. Like, of course, there were times where I messed up like and put too much grain in it or didn't add hops at the right time or whatever, you know. But for the most part, following those recipes and, you know, is a good way to actually brew the beer. Right. Uh, the other thing I like about following the recipe is you now have a baseline. Right. Like the, the recipe to me is just a guidepost. Right. It's like here's here's your first iteration of that beer, in my opinion. It's a place to start. And then you get to tweak it and do all of the things to make it the beer that you want. Right. Yeah. Like may raise make America amber again. I have to be careful so that I don't <laughs> screw that name up. But raise make amber make America amber again recipe is a fantastic beer. If you make that recipe, you're going to have a good beer. It's what you do afterwards that I think is where you get into the questions about how should I modify my brewing software or, or you know, modify the, the recipe in my brewing software to get to the beer that I want. Yeah, I, I, I got a couple comments on this one. Uh, first off, a four-point difference in SRM to me is not going to be a significantly noticeable darker or lighter beer. Uh, so I wouldn't even worry about that. That's just that's just my take. That could be a function of the grains that you're using not being exactly what Ray designed uh, his recipe with, or or uh, you know, it could be that that the the love bond of your you know, particular pale malt is just a bit lower than or higher than the one that, that, that the recipe is calling for. So that's not something I usually worry about. Like you said, Cade, uh, I, I do tweak recipes to fit my my brewery, the way that I'm brewing. So, for example, let's say Ray or let's say you, Cade, make a recipe and you're, and you're telling me, hey, this pale ale is absolutely delicious. Check it out. And you brewed it on your three tier, you know, fly sparge setup. Well, I don't brew that way. And so the way that I brew, if I'm doing a no sparge, you know, full volume mash brew in a bag type of thing, I know that I'm going to get lower efficiency than what you are getting. So I absolutely am going to adjust the amount of grains that I use. And my typical approach to doing that is, is I won't mess with the specialty grains. I will just do you know, increased base malt. Um, and if there's two big base malts in it, for example, pale malt in Vienna, I'll usually up both of those kind of, uh, to keep things equivalent, but to reach the OG that you designed the recipe to be on my system. Um, again, I don't worry too much about SRM. IBU is a big one for me. I, I absolutely try to match the IBU of a recipe. The problem is you don't know what IBU uh, calculator they're using, whether it's Garrett's or if it's Tinsith or if it's Rager, those are going to spit out a different number. And so I'll usually take the recipe, kind of look at the the hop schedule as it is and say, okay, I know how to fit that to my, you know, to my system. And then I kind of know where I want my IBU to be based on my experience brewing. Um, and so I will adjust my initial hop addition uh, that 60 minute or first wort hop addition to and uh, using IBU as the gauge rather than amount of hops. Uh, but again, that's that's based on the fact that I've brewed hundreds and hundreds of batches and just kind of know my system. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and I'm so glad you brought that up because that is what I do now, right? It is. Uh, and w- the way I do it really, though, is convert the things into percentages. Uh, so I like to work with malt bills in percentages yeah. now, right? So instead of saying 11 pounds of malt gets me X, Y, Z thing, I try to target... A, a gravity, right? So let's say I want to hit one five, oh, oh, you know, one point oh five oh, um, and, and so then I'll just change the percentages in the malts. Now I do change the character malts, um, it, which I think I think is kind of interesting that you don't. I never really thought about doing that because just because of the way I do it, I just have it all in percentages just yeah. to try to hit that that right um, gravity. Uh, same thing for hops with IBUs. Like you said, I don't really trust when a recipe says forty five IBUs, and that's because there's so many factors that go into that. Like you said, the 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 formula that you're using, but also hops from lot to lot have different alpha acid concentrations right and different oil concentrations uh in them and that's from lot to lot field to field you know so there's no way for you to say that the hop that ray brewed with in that recipe 
um, by using the exact same amount of hops, you know, it's going to produce the same beer. Right. Uh, you know, so I, I think you have to just sort of tweak all of those things. Like you said, I kind of pick the IB range having brewed on my system enough. I know where I want certain beers to be in IBU. And then I just use the percentages of the hops or more often, you know, uh, e- you know, easy, easy measurements like uh, an ounce or 28 grams a bag, right? Like I'm not going to use 24 ounce or 24 grams of hops um, when a bag is 28 grams. I just, <laughs> I'm just going to throw the whole bag in, even if that messes up the, 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 the percentage. But yeah, I, I, I like this question again. And I would say reiterate back at the top, um, try it and see what happens first. So yeah. you've got at least a baseline and then start tweaking. Absolutely. And, and uh, just to be clear, uh, it, it, I, I'm talking about if I'm using a recipe, I won't touch the specialty malts unless unless the efficiency difference is an order of magnitude, you know, <laughs> different than what I'm, if, if you're getting 85 percent efficiency and I'm getting 50 percent efficiency, I'm 100 percent adjusting by percentage then uh, at that point. But what I'm talking about is if I got a 68 percent efficiency on a, you know, full volume brew in a bag and you're getting 73 percent on whatever system. System that you designed the recipe on. Usually, I'm only I'm only adding another pound or so of base malt to get to that OG. So I'm not mess. That's it's those situations where I just won't mess with the character malts if I'm doing the same volume batch, of course. So that that was I just wanted to clarify. I'm not never touching the the character malts or the specialty malts uh, when I'm when I'm using somebody else's recipe. So well, it's time for us to take a quick break. We're going to be back with more brew and a after these messages. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at craftmastergrowlers.com. The brew in a bag method is blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAB experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at check out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. All right, we've got another set of listener submitted questions. Cade, why don't you start us off? All right, this uh, this question comes from Richie Arthurs. Uh, I have a question that I can't quite wrap my head around. Force carbonating a keg at 40 PSI for 24 hours, then moving it down to serving pressure makes sense to me. But what I don't quite understand is knowing what that equi- equ- equilibrates to. Equilibrates? I don't know how to say that word. <laughs> but uh, what I mean is, if a beer calls for two and a half volumes of CO2, how do you know that's what you hit if all you know is the PSI at your regulator? Please explain like I am five. Okay, so... <laughs> Unless you have very expensive gear, uh, actually, you can you can get away with testing the the uh, 
how the pressure of your how many volumes of CO2 with not that much money. Uh, but I, I don't have one of those. Most home brewers I know aren't going to go out and build a pressure gauge type of thing to measure the volumes of CO2 in their beer. Usually it's by feel, right? I mean, that's the way that I do it. I know what I, I know how to burst carbonate to the point uh, that I'm making beer that has the carbonation that I enjoy. And then I've, I have actually had, uh, I've got friends in, in the brewing industry who have uh, these machines that will test the volumes of CO2. So I kind of know around about where, where I'm at. I like between 2.5 and 2.8 volumes of CO2 in pretty much every style. Um, and I just know what that feels like. So it, to explain like your five, um, do do what you think feels good in your mouth and what you enjoy drinking. And it, you don't need to know the exact number, I guess, is the way um, I approach it. And that's kind of the case with so many things in brewing with me is do it to the point where you like it and, and then you're good. You don't need to know. You don't need to apply the number to it. You, there's no good way if you are burst carbonating to know exactly what your volumes of CO2 are. In fact, I, I'm not even sure the charts out there are 100% accurate. They're close. You know, those things pan out really well. Uh, but but it, like I said, if you're burst carbonating, there's just, you, it's it's kind of a guessing game and it works for a lot of us. But if you want more precision, uh, it's, it's not the method for you. Yeah, exactly. I, I would say a, a bunch of things, right? Easy one for me uh, to explain this like I'm five is I have no idea how many volumes of CO2 are actually in my beer yeah. <laughs> when I burst carbonate carbonate, right? I just have no clue. Um, like you said, I've had enough other beers that are produced commercially, you know, like either draft or can, where I assume they're measuring, uh, you know, to see what the volumes of CO2 in the can is. And I sort of have a familiarity with like that sensation or feeling yeah. that I get when I'm drinking those beers. And this is the method, burst carbonating, like you said, at 40 PSI, you know, for, for uh, you know, is 24 hours or 12 hours. I do it at 30 I do it at uh, 35 PSI for 24 hours, um, but that's what gets me to that feeling or sensation that I want in my beer, right? So it's totally a, um, I don't know if you want to say a rule of thumb or just totally subjective, uh, but that's how I get it. That's the explain it like I'm five answer. Now, there are equations that you can use to actually calculate the volume of CO2 in your beer. It requires you to have, you know, the actual volume, like, you know, liters in your beer. You can run it through um, some, I think it's the ideal gas laws that you do. Um, anyway, if you want to email me, I can dig up that equation. I know I, I found it whenever it was part of the Cicerone exam um, in their keeping and serving beer course uh, that you have to sort of figure out what the carbonation level is going to be of the beer based on what the pressure is uh, at the gauge. And so there is a calculator that you can do to do that. But again, for, for my purposes at home consumption, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Richie. That's where we're at. <laughs> Burst carbonating is for the impatient like us. And impatient people also don't tend to be terribly focused on the numbers as much as they are the experience, I would imagine. So at least that's my case. So next question comes from, <laughs> comes from Don Henley from Byron Park, Michigan. He's a huge fan of Don Henley. Henley. Uh, I just want to point out this is not Henley, it's Hindley. Uh, so he says, I like to fly sparge at a rate of 10 minutes per gallon. Yes, it adds an hour to my brew day, but it helps me nail the efficiency consistently. My question has to do with when to stop. I typically measure the SG, the specific gravity of the wort and cut off the sparge when it's around 10, 10. I've heard of you. I, I, I've heard if you keep sparging, the risk of tannins comes into play. I've also heard about all the brew in a bag successes with using the second runnings, uh, which seems to contradict the 1010 SG cutoff idea. Also, I'm always adding more water to my wort to get to my target pre-boil volume. Uh, I'd love to just keep sparging, but the wort would be well below 1010 as, uh, SG by the time I reach pre-boil. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, yeah. So I, so I hear sort of three things uh, that are in this question. I'm going to list them here so that Marshall and I can kind of talk about them um, individually. But at least what I hear is tannins from over sparging. Right second runnings right and that concept and then not hitting your boil volumes to me that's those are sort of three different questions uh that are raised here which are great questions and i love this so i want to start with sort of with tannins first um and that's uh there i want to say this up front okay there is plenty of research out there that shows that increased tannin extraction from over sparging is a thing, right? right? You you do increase tannin extraction from over sparging. That research is usually performed in mass market loggers where 
the the puckering sensation or astringency, which is the off flavor that's associated with that, may be more noticeable. And I very clearly use the term may be more noticeable. While there's no <laughs> question that increased tannin extraction happens, I always ask this question, does it impact flavor, right? right? Like, okay, even if I'm getting more tannins from over extracting, is that actually resulting in any sensation in my beer that I can taste? And the way I, I like to think about this is think about adding Cascade hops to an IPA, right? Cascade has grapefruit. It's got sort of a tart, uh, tartness, um, to it, the way that I perceive it. It's also got an herbal and a tea like character. Mm -hmm. So if I've got cascade hops in an IPA, some of that puckering sensation or astringency is the goal, right? Of, of the beer, right? Is to have that, that, that bitterness, that puckering sensation in that IPA. So I want that. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able as a taster to differentiate between, what I got from over sparging versus what the hops added. And so that's kind of what my thoughts are on tannin extraction and astringency. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Yeah. I, so my understanding is that uh, uh, extracting tannins, like you, you said it, Cade, it, there's science to back up that over sparging can lead to tannin extraction that is perceptible in beer. Um, my understanding first off is that you, your SG has to be far lower than 1010. I, I, I always, I don't fly sparge, but I always read and heard that uh, 1004 or about one degree Plato is, is where that cutoff is. So you, you've still got a ways to go, Don, uh, to, till you get that low. The other thing with tannin extraction is it is a function, not only of the, I, I guess the absence of sugars, right? But also the pH of the water that you are sparging with, as well as the heat of it, uh, the, how hot it is. And so I, I, I've had, I've talked to people who have tried to extract tannins as a, as a learning experience by over sparging and they struggle uh, to get it. And they're sparging down until basically water is just flowing out of their mash, you know, when they're loudering. So I, I, I don't think if you're, if you're having to add water to your wort to reach your pre-boil volume, just sparge more, man. Uh, you're a 1010 <laughs> yeah. SG. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Right. Like just, just sparge a little bit more to hit your volume. So let's talk about that then real quick. Um, if you're not hitting boil volumes, usually, uh, what I think about that is it's one, your grain crush, um, may not be, uh, fine enough. Like you're not hitting a, you're not getting enough sugar conversion. Um, so the, so, uh, or collecting that water. Um, and you may also want to look at your brewing software calculator to see where you're losing water. Yeah. You may not be yeah. using enough water in the mash itself. Right. Um, and that sort of leads to that second question, second runnings. Um, I think of second runnings as a different concept, right? Like second runnings to me is, if I were collecting beer for two brews or if I were, you know, sort of like like batch sparging and when fly sparging, it's all just runnings to me. Right. Like you're just rinsing the grains off and it starts at a high OG and then it ends, like you said, wherever you want to cut it off at, mm -hmm. at whatever your voil volume is or at 1010 or at 1004 or less than that, wherever. Right. This is all just one consistent running. Um, but that's kind of how I think about those things. Yeah. You know, I noticed Don uh, was referencing brew in a bag on that one. And I think. I think what he's talking about are people who take their, you know, they do a full volume brew in a bag, pull the bag out, and then they then they soak those grains in another batch of water for ten or fifteen minutes and use that sec quote unquote second runnings for another, you know, session beer or something. I, I I've never done that. It sounds like something that's completely plausible, probably works out really well. Uh, the the thing is, I guarantee you those second runnings are nowhere near that 1004 mark. You're still going to get, you know, a decent amount of, of sugar out of it. And so, the, you know, you're not going to, I don't see that as being a, a, an, an extractor of tannins by any means in doing that. Again, tannin extraction is a function of heat and pH for the most part. And so if you're paying attention to those things, usually you're not going to be in a situation, particularly with home brewing, uh, in any scenario where tannin extraction is something, in my opinion, you got to worry about. So again, Don, my, my recommendation is keep keep sparging till you reach your pre-boil volume, ferment that batch, and I'd be willing to bet cash money that you don't experience uh, astringency in your, in your mouth. So yeah, uh, say, same for me. 
so the next question then is from Corbin Robers from Denver, Colorado. Corbin says, I can't seem to wrap my head around the dichotomy of aeration and sanitation. We spend a lot of time and energy meticulously sanitizing every surface that our wort and beer will touch in order to keep it free from unwelcome microbes. But my understanding is that there's a fair bit of wild yeast and bacteria floating around in the air most of the time. I've harvested and used a couple of good ones, in fact. Uh, (laughs) If wort aeration is best practice, when you don't have a pure oxygen source, aren't you inviting small populations of unwanted organisms in when you aerate? I find this especially perplexing with regard to stir plate starters. By purposefully drawing in air for 18 hours to unhopped wort, surely our pure yeast strain isn't the only thing thriving in that flask. Especially from generation to generation, I would expect that whatever found its way into the previous starter could reproduce with the same fervor as the intended yeast strain. How are we not all experiencing Saccharomyces diastaticus in diastaticus infection or similar problems all the time? Am I missing something here? Actually, uh, Corbin, <laughs> this sounds like a question that I asked uh, that I constantly wondered about uh, back when I started doing yeast starters, uh, you know, about a decade ago. It, it, you are 100% right. It's not just most of the time, but there are wild yeast and bacteria floating around us all of the time. All of, unless you are in a uh, sanitary hood, uh, you know, you are absolutely inviting all of that stuff into whatever wort you're producing in whatever capacity, whether it's for a starter or for a beer. The idea, though, and I am no microbiologist, but the idea is that the the yeast that you are pitching, so what you are favoring, will will uh, overpower anything that does make its way in there. Uh, be- and then that alcohol that's produced through the fermentation process, again, uh, holds anything else that may have been introduced at bay. That is the understanding that I have of why it's okay for us to get away with things like yeast starters and such. Even a yeast starter within a matter of four or five hours is fermenting enough to where uh, the the uh, yeast that you pitch is going to just kind of you know overpower the uh, anything that may have come in. Also uh, on, on the on the topic of yeast starters. Most of us, when we're making a starter, cover the top of the flask rather tightly with with foil. Uh, that that does a pretty good job of keeping things out. Uh, I would imagine that you're not bringing in even that much oxygen. Uh, I was I forget who it was, but I was talking to somebody about the purpose of uh, yeast starters and using a stir plate uh, for a starter, and it, it's it's it, what they were saying at least was that the the real purpose of it is to keep that yeast suspended the entire time. It's why you don't need to have a crazy vortex in your starter uh, because you just want to keep things moving and suspended so that the yeast doesn't settle out. It's not so much what a lot of people believe uh, is that it's to pull in oxygen. And I, and my understanding is that that really isn't um, why we're using starters. Yeah. I, I, I don't know necessarily about, about that with the covering of the, of the stir plate, but I, but I do agree with you uh, with the, your comment about like it's the number of cells, right? So like the number of cells of the pure yeast that we're adding to the, the stir, the, the starter or just pitching it directly into the beer is a huge number in comparison to the number of cells that are just floating around in the air right and and i think that's the that's to me is what always made sense about that yeah and you're right that there are going to be um you know wild yeasts and bacteria and stuff floating around in the beer themselves and i like to think of you know cereal repitching as an example and i think uh you know i think corbin you even sort of brought that up as generation to generation the yeast itself changes which will which will result in different um uh, you know, uh, flavor active compounds during fermentation and different performance and such. But the bacteria and wild yeast will have a higher and higher concentration as you continue to serially repitch. And at some right. point, you're going to get to a point where you don't want to use that yeast anymore because it doesn't have the flavors that you want. And that may be due to bacteria or wild yeast or because the yeast itself changes. But again, it's all about that concentration. The number, it, to me, the number of cells of pure yeast versus the number of cells of stuff that you don't want. Yeah. And to answer the question about sac diastaticus, that stuff is gnarly. I mean, we, we all know that people have lost, I mean, you know, people have lost a lot of money uh, because of this damn yeast. And I'll tell you, it, I wonder the same thing, why we're not experiencing it more because it's around us everywhere. It, 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 it ruins beer. Um, and we do a lot of things where that wort is in the open air. It's, it's, it, there's access to it. So I don't know why we don't all have that except for 
I, I do think we deserve a little bit of credit uh, in taking, you know, taking as much care of our of our wort and our beer as possible as brewers. We're all pretty nuts about that. And so I, I, I like to think that the effort we invest in doing that is why we're not all getting infected beer and why there's good beer out there that doesn't have diastaticus in it. So that's my that's my response to that one. Uh, Corbin, I would highly recommend you, you, you know, don't stop doing uh, the things that you're doing if you like the beer that you're making. That's going to be our common response. So next question comes from, and and I have to apologize. This is the most I've never pronounced a name like this. Jiri Olkonen from Finland. Uh, that's J Y R I. Somebody please correct me on that. He says, uh, "I just had an idea. I want to run through you guys before I spoil a batch of beer." Boy, I'm not sure that we're the best ones to ask about this. Uh, would it be a good idea to treat all of my water at once, adding water additions, including acid, into my mash tun and removing my sparge water into a separate container? Before mashing in, I was thinking this would make it easier for me to handle water additions by removing the need to separately adjust my sparge water. Oh, this is cool. I've, um, yeah, I, yes, if you treat your total volume of water all at once, um, you're essentially treating both your mash and your sparge water, right? Yeah. If you've got, if you need 15 gallons of water for the entire brew process and you just treat it all at once, that's the easiest way to do it, uh, in my opinion. And that's exactly what I do. I treat the whole volume of water all at once. And like I said earlier, I just dump all of the Camden tablets and uh, salts and acid and everything all into the water all at once. Um, if your containers, though, if your ability to to collect water isn't big enough, like you you need 15 gallons, but you only have a 10 gallon kettle, then yeah, you're probably going to want to treat them um, differently, uh, you know, between your like mash and sparge water. But mm-hmm. I will say I have personal experience. I add all my salts and acid just to the mash ton water. And that was even when I was doing like, whenever I had a, a, you know, say seven or eight gallons of mash water, and then I'd add another seven or eight gallons of sparge water. Right. Um, I would still add all my salts and acid into the mash tun. And that was just a personal experience. I never had any bad effects from that. But yeah, this is a fun question. There, there were, um, there was a lot of talk, uh, a few years ago about, treating the mash water diff- separate and different, you know, than the way that you treat the sparge water. And I, I never quite understood the reasoning behind it, but, uh, you know, as the lemming that I was, I just did that. And one of the, one of the big arguments was you don't need to mineralize your sparge water, just mineralize your, your, your mash water, and then make sure your sparge water, if you have crazy pH or whatever of your, of your natural, the whatever water you're using, just make sure, but like, like we were talking about earlier, that it's not going to drop low enough to where it's extracting tannins or whatever. Um, and I knew a lot of people who did that. It, it makes zero sense to me, uh, knowing what we now know about the salts that we use in brewing, particularly sulfi- uh, sulfate and, and chloride, we know that those flavor beer, that those contribute a perceptible characteristic to beer. It makes zero sense to me <laughs> to just treat half of your water and then not treat the other stuff. It makes way more sense. And when you think about on a, on a bigger, you know, commercial brewing scale, it makes way more sense to treat the entire batch of water exactly the same um, so that you get whatever it is that you put the work in, you know, to create in that water profile. So if I'm at, if I, if I want that nice crisp hop character in an IPA, a West Coast style IPA, and I'm not adding the same amount of, of calcium sulfate gypsum to my sparge water, then I'm actually kind of working against myself is, is the way that I, I look at it these days. So now I, I do full volume mashes. So I treat my entire, <laughs> my entire water uh, together anyways. I don't want to open up a can of worms on a question that wasn't asked, but using those things uh, when you use the salts is important too, right? Some of the salts like calcium, uh, the cas- calcium, um, I think it's calcium sulfate in well, either way, whichever one. Oh, calcium chloride, of course. That's the that's the one that uh, usually is how you add chloride to it. Well, calcium also affects your mash right. as well, right? It helps. So adding that stuff at your mash is important because that helps with conversion and um, uh, helps with what's going on in your mash. Yeah. Uh, but then you can also think about adding salts later to do flavor uh, characteristics. But I always sort of think about that, too. It makes a lot of sense to me why we would have this historical tradition of adding salts at the mash level, uh, because you are actually benefiting the mash by adding uh, these different minerals and, and ingredients in there. Yeah, it's having it's having a uh, an objective impact on the your conversion and all of that stuff, as well as the sensory perceptible impact. So my 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 thing, uh, Jerry, is 
is is treat the entire batch of water first. I think that's probably the route where you, where you're going to have the most predictable results in the end, at least. Uh, is is because you are you're you know you want to get those characteristics out of the the minerals that you're throwing in there. So now, just as a quick aside, and and I get a lot of crap for this, but I no longer acidify uh, my water uh, before mashing. We've done a couple experiments on a high mash pH, one on a very low mash pH, and the beers that were produced were completely indistinguishable by people, uh, you know, actual participants in those experiments, as well as us brewers. I think Jake did the low mash pH one. I did the high mash pH one, and the beers tasted exactly the same, and the impact on uh, other more objective measures like uh, conversion and such were not different enough for me to even worry about uh, adding acid to water that I'm going to mash with. That's just my personal thing. I'm not trying to convince anybody to do anything different. But I, I again, I want to add as little as possible to the beer and and have as little in it, I guess, um, uh, in order it without you know, if as long as I'm making the beer that tastes good and 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 is, I'm getting what I'm uh, aiming for, then I'm happy with it. And the fact that I haven't been using acid for the last couple of years, I haven't told, I haven't been able to tell a single difference. So. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I I never did not use acid. I always <laughs> use acid whenever I was in Austin because our water was super hard. Right. Um. And, and I mean, we'd have pHs up over nine. Uh. You know. Um. Whenever I was brewing, and that's an interesting one. I I wish I had been able to brew a beer using hard Austin tap water. Um. <laughs> and done an experiment while I was still living there because I think that would be really fun to do it in that you know to to have that experiment done with like hard with actual you know, limestone filtered water um, that that was really hard. But yeah, that's really cool. Um, The next question comes from John Bernero. uh, And he says, now that I have a tilt hydrometer, I'm becoming more aware of how my fermentation is going. I'm seeing my FG in beers flatline in a matter of days, which brings me to my question. Do I need to keep beers in my fermenter for two weeks or can I rack it to my keg when I've had a stable FG for two plus days? Um, you don't need to do anything. <laughs> you can rack beers over whenever you feel like doing it. That's the beauty of, of brewing our own beer. That being said, there's more that's happening uh, during the fermentation process than just attenuation. That is the, that's the main thing. I get that. Um, I've, I've absolutely fermented beers that, you know, in two or three days that I end up kegging on day four or day five. But I only do that after pulling a sample and not detecting any off flavors. I mean, that's the big thing is those yeast are, are playing the role of custodian, right? They're cleaning things up. They're, they're uh, uh, you know, re-metabolizing uh, off characteristics and compounds that are created during the process, things like diacetyl or um, uh, acetaldehyde. And so one of, the, one of the things you have to consider is the beer where I want it to to be. If it tastes good and smells good and you're not picking that stuff up, by all means, I mean, I, I don't see a reason to keep it on the yeast any longer than you, than you kind of have to uh, for that kind of stuff. So um, what my, my bigger question has to do, I mean, I know a lot of people are getting into these uh, Bluetooth hydrometer things. The, do they do more than measure? I mean, I know that you can track temperature and you can track the specific gravity. I'm curious how accurate they are and if they do anything else, because I... I to go back to what I was saying, I enjoy pulling samples off of my fermentation vessel. Um, and then it's easy enough for me just to drop a, you know, a finishing gravity, gravity hydrometer into that sample before I take a sip. And, uh, but anyways, that's where I stand. Yeah, no, I love that. And I'm so glad that you brought up taste it. And I feel like this was really driven home to me whenever, while I was working at, at Blue Owl. Um, and th- like tasting your beers as they're going through fermentation is a really, really cool and really fun experience, right? You can often tell if there's going to be bad, uh, you know, off flavors or outcomes and do something to fix it before it gets like too, too difficult. And like, it's, it, yeah, exactly like you said, uh, when you hit final gravity there's still other stuff that your beer needs to do the big things are acetaldehyde and diacetyl cleanup right Mm -hmm. um and i you can definitely tell that at a commercial brewery um i know that there there were several of the beers that that i would taste i I can think of like spirit animal for example um once spirit animal hits final gravity it's a green apple bomb Hmm. i mean or like a raw pumpkin bomb it's an acetaldehyde bomb uh but when you let it sit for a couple of days the yeast takes up all that acetaldehyde or it or you know you know just degrade 
degrades. I, I don't know exactly the mechanism, but the acid aldehyde goes away. Um, and then the beer tastes fantastic. And that takes a couple of days, you know, or 24 hours. It just kind of depends on the beer. Yeah. Uh, but taste it, taste it, taste it, taste it, taste it, <laughs> taste it. Right. Are Pulse, you suggesting hand, John taste his beer? Uh, well, I am <laughs> suggesting that John taste his beer. Well, and, um, and another thing you have to consider uh, when it comes to the amount of time in the fermentation vessel is uh, the OG of the beer. I think it's a big one. Bigger beers, they, they, they can ferment equally as fast in my experience. However, uh, that's a far more stressful environment for yeast to work in. So it may be that a, you know, a, a 1035 uh, session p- potter's beer or something is done and ready to keg after three or four days. Whereas a, you know, a 1075 double IPA is done fermenting after three or four days, but you need to let it sit on that yeast a bit to kind of pick up all the stuff that it created during that stressful fermentation. Um, and that, and again, that is why a part of what I love about pulling those samples, you get to see what the beer looks like. You get an idea of what it's going to taste like in the future, but you also get this opportunity to say, well, is it ready to go? Or do I need to let that yeast continue to work for a bit? So, yeah. And, and, and to me, that was always a fascinating part of this, right? One of the cool things, um, I got to do a couple of tours, uh, like actually give the tours at Blue Owl, uh, before everything sort of shut down for COVID. And one of the cool things about the Blue Owl Tour was we would let people taste fermenting beer, right? You go yeah. back into the fermenters and draw off of the uh, of the sample cock and actually try uh, a beer. And it was so much fun because we would generally always have a spirit animal or um, a Van Dam or a Little Boss, which were the core three beers at the time. We'd always have one of those three fermenting in a bright tank and packaged, right? Mm-hmm. So they could get it out of the tap room and see what it tastes like when it's carbonated in the bright tank whenever it has you uh, maybe fallen clear but isn't uh, carbonated yet um, and then in the uh, in the fermenter where it's still going and fermenting and you can taste like the beers are radically different and it was so cool to watch people go through that and taste those different beers um, and I think that's just a fun way to learn about the different off flavors if you want to know what acetaldehyde is in my opinion still the best way to do that is try day two of your beer Take a sample of it and it, you will probably taste that uh, raw pumpkin or green apple flavor. Yeah. Or smell it. I mean, I, I, I yeah. get acetaldehyde, uh, acetaldehyde far more in the nose than I do on the palate. But uh, so, John, yeah. uh, that's our recommendation, man. Taste your beer. Well, there you have it. Episode 180 and our 17th A is in the books. Thanks again to everyone for listening and supporting us in all of the ways that you do, especially our patrons. Without you, we would not be here. Any last words, Cade? Uh, check out the brew lab as always a bunch of fun shows coming up but otherwise uh, cool q and a's that was a lot of fun yeah yeah if there's anything at all you'd like for us to address in a future brew and a episode please send your questions to feedback at brewlosophy.com and make sure you say that it's for brew and a in the subject line so we can add it to the list remember we're open books so you can ask whatever you want and yeah don't forget to subscribe to our newest podcast the brew lab where Kate takes you into the lab with brewing scientists and make sure to head to brewlosophy.com to read up on all of the fun beer and brewing stuff we're up to The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man, no.